This show is sponsored by Headnote, helping law firms get paid 70% faster with their compliant e-payments and accounts receivables automation platform. Learn how to get paid quicker and more efficiently at headnote.com. Welcome to this episode of the Modern Law Library. I'm Olivia Aguilar from ABA Publishing, and I'll be today's host. In this episode, I speak with Janet S. Cole, author of How to Train Your Expert, Making Your Client's Case. Janet practiced law for more than 30 years before retiring to write books. This is her fifth book for young lawyers published by the ABA, and she is also the author of Two Mysteries. Today, Janet discusses how to prepare for trial with experts and expert witnesses. Janet, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Olivia. Good to be here. Nice to have you, too. To kick things off, let's start off with the preface of the book. You share a story from your time as a junior lawyer defending a doctor accused of malpractice. Do you want to share that story with our listeners? And also, did that experience inspire you to write this book? Well, that's that's a compound question. I, I object to it. No, mm. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the story that I tell is just sort of an embarrassing young lawyer story. I, I was given this wonderful opportunity to defend a cardiologist uh, in a malpractice case. And I was preparing my case and, and thinking about the trial and writing briefs and, and doing all sorts of stuff pre-trial. And it occurred to me maybe a month before trial that I didn't have an expert to testify. Now, mm-hmm. in today's world, most uh, jurisdictions have a requirement that if you're going to bring a malpractice case of any kind, engineering, medical, legal, you have to have an expert or your case will be dismissed. Now, that's for the plaintiff. But for the defendant, sometimes if you don't have an expert, you're just an idiot. And I, at that point, <laughs> was an idiot because I did not have an expert. So in a panic, I called up... Uh, uh, the head of cardiology at Temple University, and asked if he would be willing to testify on behalf of this doctor that I was representing. And he said, yes. I was thrilled. Uh, he came to court. He was wonderful, sort of like, uh, I was going to say Marcus Welby, but our listeners might not know who that is, but, you know, like a, the most wonderful avuncular television doctor who explained carefully why this doctor I was representing did nothing wrong. And he was just marvelous. And, of course, the plaintiff's lawyer said to him on his cross-examination, how much are you charging to be here today? And I, my heart, heart sunk because I didn't know. I didn't have a retainer agreement with this doctor. He just showed up at my request. And I had no idea what he was going to say. And he said, I'm not being paid anything. I just felt that a bright young doctor didn't do anything wrong. And I wanted to be here and explain why I felt that way. I was stunned. Uh, Certainly, my opposing counsel was stunned. But it was extremely effective. And... um, Mm -hmm. The jury did find my client not negligent. And later I asked the doctor who testified for me, how come you said you weren't being paid anything? I feel like I should pay you. He said, no, I meant what I said. I thought that, you know, that this was an unfair slap at a very talented doctor. And all I can say is that the gods were looking out for me in that situation. Yeah, definitely. He sounds like the (laughs) ideal expert. (laughs) It was wonderful. And as to your question about whether that inspired me to write the guide, I, I, I think that what it did for me was made me realize that there are so many things to keep in mind when you're trying a case. And this is the number five in my, uh, series of books. And this is just one of those things that you really need to know about. Mm -hmm. Great. So you start off the book with the question, do you need an expert? 
and it's one of the central questions in, in your book. Could you kind of talk about the process of determining whether an expert is even necessary for trial? Well, when you added that little phrase for trial, um, I think mm-hmm. that you've really hit the bullseye, really, because you're not always going to be going to trial. Sometimes you're just trying to prepare a case in such a way that that it is a winner for your client. Mm-hmm. And that might be a settling as opposed to trying the case. So there are really two questions that are part of that one question, do you need an expert? And that is, do you need an expert to help the fact finder understand the subject matter? And do you need an expert to help you understand the subject matter? Two different kinds of experts, although sometimes they can be the same person. So, you know, the answer is, if it's a subject matter that you are completely unfamiliar with, you may want to hire someone, not for purposes of testifying at trial, but for purposes of walking you through the case. Explain this set of circumstances to me. And eventually you might wind up actually using that expert to testify, but there are different rules for testifying experts and non-testifying experts. And Mm -hmm. they have to do with discovery and being forthcoming about all the information about your expert. So when you are determining if you do need an expert, how would one go about finding an expert? Or what is the ideal way to find an expert? Well, the ideal way is multifaceted. I think if you can... See, this is sort of difficult for me to explain to a lot of lawyers now that in the old days of practicing law, there was no such thing as the Internet. You couldn't Mm -hmm. Google experts. And in addition to that, now that there are many... Uh, organizations that provide experts for trials and and also just for lawyers in general. So certainly, definitely look at the internet, Google whatever kind of expert you need, but then don't rely on that. See if you can find an experienced lawyer who is working in your jurisdiction who has had good experiences with a one or more experts and, and run those experts that you found online by your lawyer friend. And, you know, mm-hmm. also, if you're working in a big firm, you could send around an email saying, has anyone ever worked with an expert in this field? And if so, would you recommend them? Yeah, sounds like a great way to find an expert. So in Chapter 3, you list a few warnings for working with consulting experts. Could you talk about those red flags that young lawyers should look out for? Well, I'd be happy to. Consulting (laughs) experts, in my view, are the ones who know about a case because they've been involved in the details of it. In other words, let's say if it's uh, an accounting case, an accountant who walks you through the details of the case is your consulting expert. You may not have that person testify, Mm -hmm. but in addition to that, a consulting expert is somebody who may have actually been involved in the case. Now, in my field, I was working in environmental litigation, so very often on an environmental case, I had an expert who was explaining things to me who had actually worked on the polluted property or on the cleanup. And so that person could possibly wind up being a fact witness at trial. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to rely on that consulting expert to be your fact witness at trial because he or she might contradict what she was or he was saying to you about the situation at the property, let's say. So you cannot control the message that you are hoping to deliver with someone who's a fact witness. 
Right. And on that note, once the expert has materials or files that they rely on, uh, in the book, you say it's not wise to keep certain documents or facts from your expert that you consider bad for your client's case. And I wanted to see if you could touch on why that is. Well, I, it's like I always used to tell my son as he was growing up, you know, you can't keep anything from your mother. <laughs> I mean, I, I was always going to find out. Right. <laughs> so the same is really true in in court. I mean, if you if you try to hide a bad fact... It's always going to come out mm-hmm. somehow, some way. So it's better to deal with those bad facts in a way that makes them less painful. And you certainly don't want to keep it from your expert because your expert's help is going to be less valuable if you've got something that you're missing. And if that comes out during a cross examination of your expert, who's then going to be extremely peeved. Yeah. Did, did you learn this from your own experience, or was this something <laughs> that you'd heard from other lawyers? <laughs> um, I've had some experiences with other lawyers, you know, opposite me, not, not on my side, who left things out when they were telling their consultants or, or experts certain facts. And it's a very fertile ground for cross-examining the expert. And it's just one of those wonderful things when you see it and you're on the correct side, you know, you just go for the jugular. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So next in the book, you talk about the written report and you have a whole chapter on, you know, how to go about this written report. What are some common mistakes that young lawyers can make with the written report? Well, one of the things that I think is important is to remember that almost everything that the uh, expert touches is discoverable. Mm -hmm. So you want to be very careful about what you hand to the expert, but at the same time, obviously, you don't want to hide anything. And you also want to make sure that your expert is explaining things in a way that makes sense. So one of the problems that can come up when the expert is writing the report is how do you want something phrased? Now, when I say you, the lawyer, you can hope for certain deductions from the expert, but you can't force the expert to say it in a way that the expert doesn't believe is true. So one of the things that you really need to do is to let the expert write the report as you discuss it. One thing that you don't want to do is have your fingerprints, literally, on the document that the expert produces as his or her report. And that's a pretty common mistake. You, I think you said it in the book that that's a pretty common mistake. Yes, it is. I, I, yeah. In the days before everything was electronic, but you can still manage to make the same mistake electronically, I had a report from an opposing expert that had the lawyer's notes handwritten on it. Wow. That was produced in discovery. And I think that the same thing could happen here now with the uh, electronic writing, because what happens is maybe you've got some emails saying, you know, you don't really want to phrase it this way. Or maybe you have a brand new idea and you shoot it over to your expert and say, you know, maybe you should put this in. Those are not good things to do. Because again, it detracts from the veracity of your expert. Right. And it just seems like it's getting easier and easier for people to make that mistake now that, you know, we have email and all of these digital ways to communicate. So, Right. um, It's extremely important to remember that digital doesn't mean invisible. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Again, you know, if you're jumping up and down on your expert to have him or her say a particular thing, that's always going to come out. Hello, listeners. This is Lee Rawls from the ABA Journal. 
We're going to take a quick break to hear a message from our sponsor. Hey, law firms. Getting paid is fantastic, but dealing with accounts receivable is such a pain. What if there was a better way? In her head note, an industry-leading compliant e-payments and AR automation system. Their unique blend of features cuts through the noise and helps you to get paid 70% faster. Skip the paper checks, spreadsheets, and awkward calls to overdue clients. Get paid faster with less effort. Visit headnote.com for more information. Welcome back. We now return to our show, which is already in progress. So let's move on to kind of talking about the relationship that a lawyer can have with an expert. You write, your ability to control your expert witness doesn't depend on your being tough or mean. It depends on your being firm about what you want from the expert. Your relationship with the expert is collaborative, and it should be conducted with respect. So on that note, how can lawyers kind of lay that groundwork to establish a good relationship with their expert? Of course, it depends partly on on the expert's personality. Mm -hmm. I have had experts who are extremely full of themselves. And as a result, I feel as if they're sitting across from me with their nose in the air and their pinky in the air and and, you know, I, I couldn't possibly know how wonderful they are. <laughs> I think it's important to let them know that you think that they are great and you're coming to them because you want to learn. Those, those are the people who, who need to be coddled a little bit. And mm -hmm. you have to try not to get your back up over the fact that they're behaving abysmally. However, having said that, if you wind up having an expert who, even with all of the coddling you do, is still a pain in the butt, the best thing to do is get rid of that expert. You want to have mm -hmm. someone with whom you have a mutually respectful relationship. Right. And you talk about your personal experience that, you know, you've had experts speak to you in a very condescending tone, as you mentioned. When you were dealing with an expert like that, how did you manage? How did you work with them? Well, again, there are sort of two ways of doing it. One is to uh, tell them that you appreciate their expertise mm -hmm. and you really know that they know their stuff and you're very grateful. And uh, that's, that's the beginning of, of how to deal with it. If that doesn't have a good uh, outcome, I think that you go to... My client authorized me to hire you and let me know that if I don't like the way you're behaving, I can fire you. Now, I, I just mm -hmm. said that a little bluntly. You don't have to be <laughs> quite so blunt. But that is, is a powerful message for someone who's being condescending. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So when it comes to preparing your expert for a deposition, how can lawyers ensure that they're not crossing the line into what you call impermissible ventriloquism, <laughs> <laughs> which is a great term? <laughs> <laughs> well, it really is a question of, of walking the fine line between making sure that your expert is helpful, speaks in a way that is helpful and explains, but in as close to the expert's own words as you can get it. Now, some experts have just no feel for what is an informative and not overly expert witness kind of speak. So you keep slowing him or her down in your preparation, saying, you know, you have told me that this is such and such. Can you repeat that for the deposition? You don't want the expert to parrot a position that you've taken in either the complaint or the answer or a, a brief. But if, if need be, you can work with the expert until the expert gets that whatever he or she says has to be clear and helpful. So kind of towards the end of the book, in Chapter 11 specifically, 
You cover how a lawyer can guide that expert through the minefield of standards and rules while they are crafting their opinion. Could you describe the two cases that you cite in that chapter? Yes. You're talking about the Daubert rule, Daubert and and its progeny, I guess you should say. Mm -hmm. Um, It used to be that the general acceptance rule for scientific evidence was the norm for judges to allow as testimony. And then a lot of lawyers began to push the envelope with science that was not generally accepted. And the Daubert case allows if a lawyer or an expert can show that the novel scientific theory makes sense, then the judge can let it in. It's, it's really just a, it's a, it's a declaration that, that the court is the gatekeeper for whether or not science can be used in the courtroom in the way that the lawyer wants it to. It's, it's a mm-hmm. way of weeding out what used to be called junk science. Now, there are 50 states, and there's a federal court system. That means that there's 51 different standards for whether or not something is admissible. And my point really in that chapter is be sure you know what the rule is and whether or not the expert's opinion is going to be allowed. And if it's not, then you've got to figure out some way of making it palatable so that whatever the novel theory is can come in. And I I think I I might have uh, emphasized that when you're looking to put in novel scientific ideas, it's it's great if you succeed, you'll be well-known in your legal community, but it could wind up costing your client a bundle. And if you can avoid novel theories, you're much better off. Yeah. Speaking of the, I think one of the main lines in the book of advice that you give to young lawyers is, and as for rules, read them. Um, I wanted to see, besides that, if you could give one piece of advice to young lawyers dealing with their first expert or expert witness, uh, what would that be? Besides knowing rules. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, it's hard because I always say in every book for young lawyers, read the rules. I mean, the mm-hmm. rules are like a, a guide guidepost. The rules are, are a Bible for mm-hmm. what's allowed and what isn't allowed. Before you even talk to your expert, you should know what the rules are, what you're going to have to put forward both for the court and for your opponent about the expert, the expert's credentials, you know, what, whatever, you need to know the rules first. And the mm-hmm. other thing I think that's very important is don't try to go it alone. If you've got lawyers in your office who have experience, talk to them about it. Talk to them about what you should be looking for, what you should ask your expert to do, And, of course, whether or not you need an expert. Well, there's a lot of advice in this book and a lot of important information for young lawyers. And I really, really enjoyed reading it. On that note, where can our listeners reach you if they're interested in learning more about your work? Well, I have a a website, which is coleslaw, (laughs) K-O-L-E-S-L-A-W.com. And it talks about all of my books, including this newest one. So... That's a great place to go. And then there's an area that will allow you to email me. Great. That's a great name for a website. (laughs) 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 Well, Janet, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you. And you can purchase How to Train Your Expert, Making Your Client's Case at the ABA web store. Go to AmericanBard.org forward slash products. That's AmericanBard.org slash products. If you enjoyed this episode of the Modern Law Library, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast listening service.